welcome. And thank you so much for joining what I know is going to be a very informative and interesting program on the motherhood and caregiving penalty, which is one of the most entrenched biases in the workplace today. Unfortunately, being a mother and a caregiver <coughs> still impacts women lawyers in all facets of their careers, including hiring, evaluations, compensation, promotions, access to allies and sponsors, and business development opportunities. As we preface our discussion, it is important to emphasize that what holds back lawyer mothers is not a lack of focus, ambition, a failure to be a good team player, or not being strategic about their career. Rather, decades of commission research show that their advancement and success is impeded by pervasive cultural and structural biases against mothers and caregivers, which are deeply baked into legal institutions and law firms. For many women lawyers, the difference in their everyday work experiences that they face on account of their gender and their status as mothers and caregivers amount to a death by a thousand cuts, which results in their voting with their feet and walking out the door of their law firms. The motherhood and caregiving penalty, as we all know, existed long before the pandemic but it should be recognized that over the past 16 months, the, uh, the disproportionate burdens have been shouldered by lawyer mothers who've had to juggle remote school, childcare, elder care, and other household obligations, while at the same time that they manage their caseload and other client responsibilities. I urge you to go to the commission website, which lists many of the research and studies we'll be discussing today, such as fair measure, visible invisibility, you can't change what you can't see, men in the mix, left out and left behind, and the walking out the door and practice forward surveys that Stephanie Scharf and I co-authored. Our amazing panel will delve into these research and these studies, and we'll discuss some of their most significant findings. And we'll address the types of best practices and strategies that legal employers can utilize to address and ameliorate the motherhood penalty, and what we can do as individual lawyers to interrupt this bias when we see it. We hope that this program will be very interactive and that you will post your questions in the Q, using the Q&A function, which we will try to weave in as we, uh, dis as we discuss some of the subject areas. Um, and we have reserved some time at the end to cover questions. The uh, program is also being pre-recorded so that you'll be able to make it available to your networks network for those who cannot participate. So without any further ado, I wanna start by asking each of our distinguished panelists to introduce themselves. I'm gonna start alphabetically with Michelle Coglin. Thanks, Bobby. I really appreciate it. I appreciate all your um, comments uh, opening us up here today. Um, I'm Michelle Browning Coglin, and I am uh, currently in-house as the general counsel of a technology company called El Toro. I previously had spent about 12 years in, in, um, in law firms. And I also am the founder of uh, organization that I an organization that I started in 2013 called Mothers Esquire. It started as a Facebook group and has grown into an organization focused principally on this particular issue, which is the motherhood bias um, and caregiving bias um, as, as a part of the overall whole gender equity. So I'm very pleased to be sitting on this panel with these other wonderful panelists today. Thank you, Michelle. Fatima. 
Hi everyone, I'm Fatima Goss Graves. I'm president and CEO at the National Women's Law Center here in Washington, DC. I'm also one of the co-founders of the Times Up Legal Defense Fund, which we house and run at the National Women's Law Center. And at the Law Center, we fight for gender justice in the courts and in public policy and in our cultural conversations, really. And over the last year and a half, it won't surprise anyone that uh, the experiences that mothers have been having in work and beyond have been a giant priority for us. So, so glad to be here. Andreas. Good morning, good afternoon. Thank you very much for having me on the panel. I am a judge on the Minnesota Court of Appeals. Uh, previously, I worked as a law firm associate, in-house counsel and law firm partner, as well as judicial law clerk. I'm currently uh, uh, serving on the American Bar Association's uh, Commission for on Women in the Profession. I'm a commissioner there. I'm co-chair of both the Legislative Committee and also co-chair of the Men in the Mix Committee. And I hope we can talk about that a little bit and, and the study that we did there. I'm also active in the ABA in the House of Delegates, Judicial Division, Business Law section as an advisor to that, TIPS and Intellectual Property. And I'm delighted to be here as part of this panel. Thank you. And we're definitely going to be talking about men in the mix. Stephanie. Thank you. Um, I've been a lawyer for over 35 years. Um, I had two children when I was in law school, and then I jumped into practicing law um, first as an associate and partner, Kirkland and Ellis, and then Jenner and Block. And then uh, about 10 years ago, I formed a women owned law firm, Sharp Banks Marmor. I still like practicing law, although recently I joined it with my first career, which was as, as a social scientist. Um, I've been very lucky to have a wonderful research partnership with Bobby Liebenberg. And she mentioned our, we've done, I don't know, 15 national studies, but the most recent one is uh, practicing law and the pandemic and moving forward, which has a big portion of the data of the impact on women and women with children and what to do about that. So I'm really glad the commission is using its voice to focus on motherhood and childcare issues and the penalties and the prospects for going forward. I'm very honored to be able to contribute to the conversation. And I'm Bobby Liedenberg. I'm a partner at Fine Kaplan and Black in Philadelphia where I concentrate my practice in complex commercial litigation and I trust class actions. Um, I am also a principal in the Red, Re Red B group with Stephanie. I'm a former chair of the ABA Commission on Women. Uh, I had my first child in law school and have two other children and three grandchildren. So I am deeply concerned and focused about what are the impediments to um, lawyer moms. So this will be a great panel. And to kick us off, Stephanie, um, can you, I think to, to lay the foundation, can you describe what is the motherhood penalty and why is it so pervasive in the workplace? Uh, the motherhood penalty is actually a pretty common term these days. And it refers to the wage gap that is, that is experienced by women after they become mothers. And it's not just women in the law, it's women in every type of workplace. Um, where working mothers have less income than working fathers and less income, by the way, than single women or women who are not parents. So on average, the motherhood penalty starts within about a year of the birth of the first child. Um, it's sometimes uh, discussed in tandem with what's called the fatherhood bonus, because it turns out that parenthood plays out very differently in income for mothers than for fathers. And in the law, I we've probably seen the motherhood penalty, all of us in, in a, many different ways, not just income, but in rates of advancement and getting good assignments. And all too often the penalty really leads not just immediately to lower income, but it really need, leads to more stunted careers and unfortunately, a whole bunch of very talented lawyers who are mothers often leave the legal profession. And Stephanie, we have done quite a bit of research um, that really, I think, puts into perspective this motherhood penalty because motherhood seems to trigger 
negative assumptions about a woman lawyer's competence and commitment to their career. And uh, it does have this domino effect on evaluations and um, assignments, and uh, obviously, ultimately for promotion. Um, and just going back to your, your first comment, uh, we know that um, from just general research about motherhood in a resume study, that just putting that you're a member of a PTA on a resume uh, results in, uh, in, in, a, in a, a test that was given um, with uh, mothers 72% uh, less chance of being hired and $11,000 less in being offered uh, as a starting salary. So it starts right away. And we also know from uh, Fair Measure and our other studies that um, this negative assumptions is really triggered by uh, maternity leave. So associates who are stars before they went off on maternity leave, somehow when they come back, get more negative evaluations, fewer assignments. And as one uh, of our focus group, focus group group participants said, you know, I had a baby, not a lobotomy. <laughs> so uh, Stephanie, Stephanie, can you expound on some of our research? Because it really yeah. goes to that. We, we have a lot of findings about that, how women with children, especially in the pandemic, are totally overwhelmed. And I want to pick up on something Bobby said, though, because very often, it's not that people say to themselves, okay, I really hate women who are mothers and I'm gonna make sure they don't get ahead. Um, some of it is what's been termed benevolent paternalism, which uh, is a phrase in this country that has a very unhappy history because it, it's, it was used 200 years ago even to, to justify slavery. But it comes up in today's context because benevolent paternalism refers to decisions that are made by, by, about women by others. And those decisions prevent mothers from moving forward or getting the necessary skills and, advance, and, and uh, experiences to advance. And I'm sure we've seen this or heard this a thousand times. I, I did for many years and still sometimes in settings hear this. Things like, well, Jane has a baby. She can't travel out of town and help with that trial. So we're not going to ask her. Or Jane has young kids. She can't work long hours on that deal. We're not going to ask her. You know, Jane's son is not doing very well. So she's better off not being on a fast track to partnership. And my all-time favorite, which in my lifetime I have heard, Jane's husband would not like her working late at night on an all-male team. So sometimes these comments, sometimes these comments are said out loud, not very often. Sometimes they're said in smoky back rooms, uh, but sometimes they are simply thought and acted on. So I would say one of the one of the problems we have to grapple with today is in a constructive way, alerting people to the types of motherhood penalties that exist, which they may not even give a second thought about. They may think they're trying to help. And we got to sort of get this straightened out. And, and quite frankly, if you ask any lawyer mom with respect to travel overnight, if they would like to go to a hotel where they could order room service and watch TV by themselves, you will see that they would be jumping up and down to get that assignment. But it is, it is really true that making these assumptions about what a lawyer mom may want and it does have this effect because those are the types of cases that can really advance one's career. So I mean, it's really important. Um, and before we move on, Stephanie, I do wanna to touch on uh, some of the findings from walking out the door where we had experienced women lawyers, lawyers who've been practicing 15 plus years. And what was reported in our study about how they were perceived with respect to their commitment to their careers. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, the sort of implicit biases that occur in real life kind of occur when you're looking at people and making judgments about them. And um, the fact of having children kind of, I hate to use the word, but it almost infantilizes 
how women can be perceived. It's as though their whole life is dominated by children and taking care of children. So their experiences about getting assignments and being selected um, were very different. Even experienced women lawyers were very different from men in the same firms, in the same cultures. And uh, ultimately, for many women, that became the number one reason why they decided to leave their firms. They just couldn't manage everything together. And I want to hasten to add, I don't think it's on the women to manage everything together. I think it is on employers to figure out how to have policies and real practices, not just written words, that allow women with children, and let's face it, that's probably the majority of women uh, at certain ages, women with children to stay engaged and to advance. Because otherwise, and Bobby and I wrote an article about this lately, we projected what will happen if firms can't keep women in the law. And they are gonna be in 10 years out of it when it comes to clients. Why would clients want to hire a firm that has virtually no or a minuscule percentage of experienced women lawyers? And experienced women lawyers are going to be heavily dominated by women with children. Not everyone, but a lot. So to me, this is a, this is a systemic problem. It's a problem for employers to fix. We don't need to fix the women. We need to fix the workplace. Yes, well said. Stop blaming the women. <laughs> um, but I think what's what's really important from a practice forward survey is that um, we saw this in walking out the door, which was pre-pandemic. 63% of women said that they were perceived as not as committed to their career compared to 2% of men. And after, uh, during the pandemic, our practice forward survey found that mothers, especially mothers with young children, felt that they were being overlooked for assignments that they were not being considered for important work and that they were viewed again as not sufficiently committed to their careers. So we had this pre-pandemic, but again, post-pandemic, we know that because of the, um, uh, the burdens, the, the, as I said, the disproportionate burdens that women lawyers had with respect to childcare, men, and we, we need to get more research on this, were able to devote more time to their career. So we need to accumulate and really research data. What happened to women and women with children during the pandemic? We know that billable hours were not reduced. Did their compensations go down? Did they have equal access to the type of work that they had pre-pandemic? Did women of color, since we know from our visible invisibility, have trouble getting assignments in regular times? Did that get exacerbated during the pandemic? So these are things that Stephanie and I hope to um, really research uh, and gather data on. But I, I do wanna turn to um, you, Fatima, because we know from our visible and visibility study, that for example, women of color, 72% uh, in our visible and visibility study reported that they were perceived, perceived as being less committed once they had or adopted a child compared to 9% of white men. So how does race, ethnicity, gender identity, and disability impact the careers of mother, mothers and caregiver lawyers? You know, I, I'm, I'm so grateful for the research that has happened on this front and the identifying the need of research ahead, because what we know generally is that the race and sex stereotypes that we all hold in our minds, um, they get exacerbated when you add things like motherhood. There is, a, you know, there are stereotypes about black and brown motherhood and what that means for them that people shape knowingly and unknowingly around how they make decisions. And what that looks like for black women in particular are all sorts of assumptions about what and how they show up at work and what it looks like for them to parent and, a, and not very much forgiveness for actual parenting needs. So to your last point, I think the research that really needs to be done is how different populations of moms have fared in this pandemic and having a deep understanding of the legacy and leftover assumptions that people will hold 
even as there is a reopening, even as child care settles down, because what we know is that the burdens were different in fact, that for men during this pandemic period, actually they reported having to do less, whereas women reported having to do five times more. Yeah, exactly. And I, I, I'm, I'm, uh, it's something that we are going to uh, discuss in a little bit, but we know even as offices have uh, reopened, there are more men in than women. That means that they're having more face time. They're having more opportunities perhaps to get assignments and our firms really being cognizant of what this may mean with respect to a gender divide. And, and Michelle, I, I want you to augment what Fatima discussed in terms of challenges that, for example, single mothers have. Um, and, and Judge Reyes, I'm gonna ask you to talk a little bit about sort of the multi-generational differences uh, in households and how that impacts the motherhood penalty. So first Michelle and then Judge Reyes. Thanks, Bobby, and thanks, Fatima. I think <clears throat> similar um, to what Fatima is talking about is that we get these layering on of, of biases and assumptions. And so as we've talked about these assumptions around commitment, competence um, with single mothers too, again, that benevolent uh, paternalism uh, can come into play where there's a thought that not only is, is this person a mother, but she's a mother who doesn't have uh, potentially a partner at home that's co-parenting and therefore or is again, even further um, uh, less committed and uh, is again, less likely to be able to be selected for, for um, the kinds of assignments. And, and you know, I really appreciated um, Stephanie and Bobby, the, the research behind this that you all brought out. And, and I, I like to think about it. It's not, it's not only that they're making assumptions about women, they're making sort of the opposite assumption about men. And so part of that gender disparity around pay has to do with this perception that women are caregivers and men are breadwinners. And therefore, when women um, are caregivers, uh, there's actually an assumption that not only does Jane not, um, uh, Jane not want to have the assignments, but that Jane's husband uh, is the breadwinner and therefore needs more money, um, going to that fatherhood bonus. Um, so, and I also think uh, this affects single mothers um, very prominently and, and all mothers, but the, the issues of unpaid labor that happen both in the office and outside of the office are incredibly important. And so that need for a mom um, to be a volunteer at school, for example, um, and how that then can impact billable hours and sort of the disparate expectations around what moms and dads should do in terms of various types of unpaid labor. And I think all of those things just add up uh, to create this, this, this penalty against moms and assumptions against moms and, and judge reyes yeah so i i, I just want to make a a couple of uh, observations and comments first of all i wanted to uh, echo what stephanie said in terms of benevolent uh, paternalism and that this is not necessarily something that people are doing with ill will or ill intent this is a, a societal issue that we have here. It's an institutional issue that we have within the legal profession and it pervades all of us. But in particular, it, it, it certainly pervades men and, and, and men in positions to be able to help advance women, promote them, hire them in the first place. Um, second is that the oftentimes I think it's easy for men to look at this as an either or proposition. Either you're committed to the practice of law or you're committed to being a mother. And it's not an either or proposition. We all have uh, different aspects of, of our lives or at least should, uh, whether it's family or friends or uh, outside activities. And why should we be penalizing women for performing an incredibly important function in, in terms of motherhood? And taking it to the next step in terms of multi-generational households that you had mentioned and kind of the sandwich generation, uh, this, is, this is a very real issue as people have, uh, they're taking care of young children, uh, they may end up taking care of uh, parents uh, or even grandparents who are in ailing health and they, they need some type of, of care uh, given to them. Uh, they may even be taking care of their grandchildren. 
this is this is something that is a real issue that affects women disproportionately. And it's something that also to what Fatima had been talking about, uh, definitely affects communities of color. Uh, brown and black families uh, oftentimes have, uh, it, it's kind of part of our culture where we will very, very often have a multi-generational family. We'll have grandparents in the same house with uh, ch young children and even uh, uh, great grandparents. So it, it's something that is, is a challenge uh, for people, for women in terms of having to take care of multiple generations. So this is something that I think that uh, those of us in the legal profession and particular people in positions to make change and men in particular, we need to be aware of. We need to ask those questions and see what we can do and look at that as a positive because women in that position, they're, they're probably the best multitaskers you will find. So those are really the people that we should be trying to hire and promote. Uh, those are the people I want on my team because I know they're gonna be doing a far better job because of what they have learned just as a practical matter in, in their own daily lives. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I had um, said before that after this pandemic, I was shocked that anyone could say, what do working women do all day? because to me, they're like superheroes. It's probably should be an Olympic uh, event in terms of feeding your children, getting them to daycare and to camp, whatever, and out the door and into the office. Probably uh, probably should be uh, in the Olympics. But um, there has been a comment, and, and I do want to um, just talk a little bit about this conflict between being the ideal worker and the ideal mother, because that really is what affects uh, the motherhood penalty because the ideal worker commits all of their energy and time and dedication to their job. And then moms are supposed to do that for their families. So I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. And also sort of a lightning rod. Do you have any recommended best practices to, to um, deal with these negative assumptions about the motherhood bias or benevolent paternalism before we move to the next topic? I'm going to start with you, Fatima. Well, as you were talking about this sort of ideal worker versus ideal mother, I one of the things about the sort of disruptions that a pandemic brings is a, an opportunity to reevaluate what it is that we mean when we say someone is a success, someone is a successful at work, at home, or beyond. And we've learned a lot of things about what that looks like. But it also requires us to understand that we have been in an extraordinary hundred year time. And so how you evaluate the ability for someone to stay connected to work, to be able to hold their homes together and be glue in their community, I think we have to come up with different language and different supports. So I, um, it would probably do employers well generally to abandon all of the old notions that they have and to come up with new ones as a part of their planning for the future of their workforce. Yeah, great. In, in our Practice Forward survey, um, specifically 67% of women respondents reported that they would want their employers to implement more comprehensive family and, and um, uh, family uh, sick and family uh, plans with adding days to uh, parental time off, adding months to parental leave, other types of resources, stipends for tutoring. And, and so clearly we know that um, women in particular want these types of resources. Stephanie, any recommended best practices? Yeah, and I'd like to focus on something that we all experienced during the pandemic and that um, I don't think, and many of us don't think is going away. And that is either fully remote working or some hybrid combination of remote working and being in the office. And, you know, we all had some experience with that in the past. We used to call it, we still do flex time work, where sometimes you're in the office, sometimes you're not. Sometimes you're not working full-time, part-time work. And unfortunately, some of those policies got the um, very negative acronym of the mommy track. So 
I think now that both men and women have an idea of the value of being able to work remotely and the fact that you can work remotely and do well, I do think it's time for employers to rethink about how can we make a hybrid work policy do well? Because hybrid work policies are really family friendly and they could be very appealing to large numbers of women with children. And there are ways to do it. Um, you know, we have to, instead of spending that extra money on one office for everyone, use that money to redesign and hire people to help you redesign policies so that whether lawyers are in the office or not, they're really engaged and the firm keeps them engaged so that they have the tech, another factor is getting the technology and administrative report that people need to be productive no matter where they are. I mean, the whole idea is to have a policy. It doesn't matter where you are, it matters what you're doing. So once you kind of buy into that basic concept, then you can think about what do lawyers need? What kind of metrics can we use to make sure that we are treating people as we would like to treat them and giving people, all people, the same opportunities no matter where they are? How do we want to measure how well we're doing that? Um, and also, there's a great deal to be said for role modeling um, the, and, and for praise and for success stories. If somebody's working from home and developed a whole case up to the trial and spent only three days in the office, then that person should be praised and leaders should be role models as well. I know many, many senior leaders, they're not in the office every day. They're working from home part-time too. And there's nothing wrong with saying, I do this and I know other people can do it and I support it. So I'm sort of throwing darts here because there are a number of factors that I think can be taken into account, but it's all doable. And yeah, we're, gonna, we're gonna spend some time on hybrid work because um, that really is a place where could be if implemented intentionally and really well thought out could stem some of its attrition. But Michelle, what about some best practices on this issue around evaluations and assignments? What can we do to make sure that these negative assumptions don't seep in and really, uh, as you said, you know, impact that women by themselves are always um, evaluated on their performance as opposed to their potential? Mm -hmm. Thanks for bringing that up. And I was, um, before you came to me, was going to say many of the things that um, Stephanie had said as far as general um, things. So I appreciate all of her comments there. Um, I think, uh, and I, I think Ashley has actually put a link to this in, in the comments as well or in the chat as well. But the bias interrupters study that was also done by the commission and um, backtracking a bit, I think uh, Fatima and I didn't uh, neglected to mention that we are also both commissioners on the um, ABA a Commission on Women with Judge Ray and very honored to be a part of this great organization. Um, and in any event, um, in, in addition um, to some of the research that's already been discussed, the link to the bias interrupters is there. I think implementing that, really ingraining that kind of concept into the culture can make a very big difference in terms of looking at evaluation and considering assignments, looking at bonus allocations, looking at promotion allocations. So really ingraining the uh, idea into a work culture about stopping, assessing for, am I assuming that um, that Tamika doesn't want to go to this conference because she has a new baby at home? Or did I ask Tamika if she'd like to go? Um, so really like thinking about those kinds of um, moments where we can stop and reflect on the biases that we may be um, entertaining into our um, thought process versus um, whether we're actually asking. Um, something else which might seem a little bit off base from your question, but I think is actually right on target, paternity leave. If your leave at your employer is only for women when a baby is born or adopted, then you are signaling from the outset that women are caregivers and men are providers. And you are starting a snowball that's gonna to continue to roll downhill because that is <clears throat> just creates a place where women do get put behind. Um, and, um, and, and it signals to men that 
their, their role as a caregiver is not important, it's not valuable. And I think that speaks to a lot of the research that showed up in the walking out the door um, study that you cited earlier, where you know this path continues on from birth of women taking on uh, the vast majority of the responsibility and men often feeling that they don't have that. So that then kind of carries over into the way that we perceive people. And, and just to kind of close out my comments and going back to you talking about the ideal mother versus the ideal worker. In addition to all the studies and research that you've cited here today, I do encourage people to look at Shelly Carell's uh, research um, at Stanford on motherhood penalty. And what some of the research that's come out of that in, in addition to, to what's been said here is that even when a woman um, who is a mother will go into the workforce and do everything it takes to show how committed and how competent she is, then there's a backlash against her for not being a good enough mother. And therefore, they don't want to promote her, her or give her additional opportunities because they perceive of her negatively as somebody they don't like um, and, uh, and don't see as a leader. Um, so I think it's just such a catch-22 for women that, um, going back to what you really had asked, is that really thinking about these biases, examining them and stopping in a moment where that may impact your thinking, um, I think is such an important way that employers should move forward. And yes, fact, please don't judge the women. Please don't fix the women. No more fixing the women. Yeah. And in fact, the research shows that just having evaluators read about implicit biases about the motherhood penalty before they start an evaluation diminishes the bias and negative comments about caregiving later on. So another, um, the the, the bias interrupter, interrupters has some uh, recommended best practices um, in particular with respect to evaluations and making sure that assignments are given out fairly so that um, even those taking hybrid will have access to the types of assignments that will be important to the development of their career. Judge Reyes, you were one of the co-chairs of the Men in the Mix. And I think it's, it's really important in terms of um, best practices and, and talking about what um, Michelle alluded to and, and in particular making uh, family leave neutral so that there shouldn't be a disparity between mater maternity leave and paternity leave. It should be neutral to encourage everyone to take it. But if you could describe a little bit about the Med in the Mix projects and some recommended best practices, because we need our men as allies in this and what they can do. Sure, happy to talk about it. And I, I came in late in the game in the Men in the Mix as a program that in research that started well before me, actually, when Stephanie was chair of the Commission on Women in the Profession. So I have to give credit where, where credit is due. Uh, but I'm very happy to continue the work on Men in the Mix, and essentially the report that came out, I, I think there are a lot of positives about it. First and foremost, I think one of the positives is men want to be allies. Men want to see women succeed in the profession. The question that came up in the research interviewing women and men is uh, men oftentimes want to know how, they're not quite sure how to do that. And so one of the, I think, great uh, takeaways from that is we have some best practices that came out of it, including uh, encouraging men to uh, be involved in women's affinity groups, for example, attend events focus on diversity and inclusion, uh, and, and proactively mentoring, coaching, and championing and sponsoring women. I like to talk about that a little bit more, but a couple others are uh, making sure that, uh, that we as men don't assume that we know what our female colleagues want or think. Ask questions and listen and, and really think about the situation that they may be in and the challenges they may, they may have and what can we do to really change whatever institution we're in, whether it's a law firm, whether it's in-house counsel, whether it's in the judiciary. I've been in, fortunate enough to be in all those positions, and there's work to be done in, in all of our institutions across the board. Uh, but really that listening to find out and, and then asking, what, what are your recommendations? What do you think we should do? Because I will tell you as a male, I don't have all, all the answers. And the more opinions and the more feedback I receive, the better chance I have to make substantive changes, both personally, 
as well as in the institution. I also happen to be a co-chair of our Court of Appeals Equality and Justice Committee. And, and we're taking a good hard look at what we are doing as a court, as a judicial system, to make sure that we are uh, we are a welcoming environment. We're one where, where people want to work, that we are an employer of choice, that we aren't having uh, treating women uh, disparately, whether intentionally or unintentionally. And for the most part, I think much of that is unintentional. Uh, but we also want to make sure that men are actively promoting uh, women and, and hiring them. Um, I have uh, in next month, in just a few weeks, uh, I, I hire uh, three clerks each year. And one of the clerks I'm hiring uh, is, is, a, is a mother. And during the interview, uh, she offered that, she, she brought that up. And I, I was very interested in that and hearing from her. When I went to law school, I had two children. I had a third in law school. Uh, so I, I do have some, a uh, little bit of understanding of how challenging it can be and how limited your time is and how you really need to uh, uh, juggle lots of different things. But that's a skill that lawyers need to have you have multiple clients, you have multiple assignments. Women who have children know how to do that, that juggling act. And that, that is a skill that I think actually translates. So seeing those as positives, as something that is of value to, uh, as, as a lawyer and to whether it's in a law firm, in-house, judiciary, whatever position that you're in. So those are some of the takeaways from that study. Yeah, and I think it's really important because, again, research shows that organizations that believe they're meritocracies, like law firms, are actually more susceptible to implicit biases because they believe that everyone is going to advance and succeed purely on merit. And they don't understand how implicit biases can impact a career. Um, and, and Fatima, I don't know if you have any uh, recommendations in terms of what are some of the implicit bias training that could be effective here? You know, one of the things that's really interesting is that we many law firms and legal organizations generally have now been engaging in implicit bias training around race, helping people to understand um, the, the biases that we all hold. Those trainings often don't include um, other biases that we all hold. They, they don't always include around gender. They don't always include around parenting status, around disability, around the range of characteristics that shape perhaps how people show up or not, but for sure are biases that we all hold. So one thing that I would suggest is that this is a very good time for employers to evaluate the training programs that they have and think about how they're gonna match this moment. And, and to go back to something that I have said earlier is that the thing, my deep worry, the thing that keeps me up at night is that the last year we had a historic caregiving catastrophe where our care infrastructure basically crumbled and where many times women filled in the gap and that the assumptions and perceptions that will be left over for our COVID caregiving understandings will be strapped onto women in a going forward way that don't match their reality. And so I, you know, this is a this is a little bit more nuanced, but what an opportunity, especially at the manager and decision making level to shape the perceptions and remind people of the biases that they are likely holding and how they can make decision, how they can influence decision making, whether we're talking about pay or opportunity or that big case or whether we're even talking about hiring in the first place. And I think that goes back to something, Judge Reyes, you were about to get into, and that is male sponsorship and, and why that's so important, because sponsors are those that really advance uh, individuals who aren't in the room. They really sort of take their credibility and vouch for them. So how can, and because there are more male lawyers and more male, male in, in leadership, how can men really um, affirmatively help women through sponsorship? and mothers. 
Yeah, I, I think that that's a, it's a great question. And it's really important for men, I, I believe, to go just beyond mentorship, where you're a resource and they come in and your doors available to ask questions. That's great. But sponsorship is taking it to the next level. Sponsorship is, uh, and, and, and I think what men, what we as men need to do is recognize this bias that is out there uh, and that is institutional and we may even have it ourselves. But if we don't have it, we need to recognize that it's there either within ourselves or in the institution and then take steps to overcome it. So sponsorship is a great way to do it. So when women are coming back from being on maternity leave rather than just saying, oh, you know, you know saying, hey, welcome back. Oh, you know, great to see you again. And then leave it at that. Do more than that. Take that person and say, hey, you know what? I want to let's make sure you're getting really good assignments. You're getting back into uh, the system. Here are some of the cases that we're working on. Let's see if we can get you assigned to these. Uh, we're going on a client development. Would you like to join us and be part of the pitch team? Uh, we are, are, are looking at um, uh, having somebody on the hiring committee. Would you like to serve on the hiring committee? Because that can be very, very influential as well in terms of having somebody with that perspective of looking at the women that are coming in and what they can bring to the table. So there are lots of different ways that you can do it, but it's really about the men putting their own, uh, having some skin in the game to make sure that the women are advancing and not slipping through the cracks. Also making sure that uh, the, the evaluations, this is an area that I think really a lot of employers can take a good hard look at. What is the way that people are being evaluated, both in writing and what are the unwritten rules? Because those unwritten rules, I remember when I was in-house, we talked about them all the time uh, in our diversity committee of what are some of the unwritten rules? In other words, what are some of the assumptions that we are all making that we need to put aside and, and, and realize that those implicit biases that we have really don't have any place? Assumption that women are on the mommy track versus being on the partnership track. Assumption that women aren't as capable because now they're 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 devoted more to their family than they are to, to the firm. This false dichotomy that we create. So, what are the criteria that are being used? And I think employees really need to take a good hard look at those and reevaluate those and, and and make sure that everybody is clear what it is. The billable hours, do we really need to evaluate people on billable hours because people are in flex time or part time? Why don't we look at the quality of work that they're doing? Isn't that really what we're about? And women lawyers put out high quality work. Two thirds of my clerks have been female. And there's a reason for that. They're really good at what they do and they are top notch workers. And I'm gonna continue to hire top notch female clerks because that helps me that gives me a different perspective and that helps in the administration of justice. As a, a former uh, judicial clerk, I, I can say one, just having that relationship with the judge is incredibly special and it really provides such an incredible experience, both writing and thinking and working with a, with a judge. And so if you have that opportunity, it is really, really incredibly special. So um, you're taking that time is really gonna help a whole a whole new cadre of women lawyers. So, so we thank you. Um, I do want to talk a little bit, and Stephanie sort of kicked it off. And, and I do want to mention there's a, a, a comment in the chat talking about rules of the road where um, a firm um, had offices, uh, but they only told the men that if they wanted to come in, they could use an office, but they neglected to tell um, her with a small child that this office was available. So knowing the rules of the road and um, that is something that has really impacted women and of course women with children. But prior to the pandemic, almost every single law firm implemented some type of part-time or flex time. Unfortunately, only six to 7% of lawyers availed themselves of that type of schedule and of the people that did it, two thirds were women. So. You know, we have learned some lessons from the pandemic, but again, how are we going to overcome this stigma about flex time? How do we avoid this characterization that it's the mommy track? How do we 
uh, emphasize what Judge Reyes just really spoke about is that why aren't we um, rewarding efficiency and quality over billable hours? I don't know who wants to take this question. Fatima. I'm happy to start. I, I So I, I actually think we should start by a, acknowledging that this is hard, that this is a really hard time, not just for the workers, but for people who are leading. And so sometimes when things are hard, we are a little bit reluctant to, to step back a little bit and, and do some reflection, but it's precisely the time to do it. So it may be precisely the time to reevaluate, just as you said, how it is that we are measuring success, right? What, what is our definition of efficient? And, and so that we actually have something that looks much more uh, like a legitimate baseline of how it is that the workforce is faring rather than all mixed up with our assumptions and stereotypes and frustrations. And then the other thing that I would add that is also a very tough thing is that it, you know, and, and Stephanie raised this before that it, it, we are going to continue to have a wobbly care infrastructure for a significant period of time. And if your goal right now, especially during a huge talent war, is to maintain your top performers, you're going to have to step back and think about what does that look like? So if people are working remotely and saying, I feel disconnected, I, you know, I don't know if I'm getting the right assignments, whose job is it to actually shift the structure so that you don't lose that top person because they're in a six month care crisis. That, you know, that is real leadership looking beyond this very specific period of time. And in a way, so, you know, it's not totally altruistic. Like I want to help these people at this phase. This is a, this is also, there is an incredible business case to do the hard work of evaluating the systems that you need going forward. Michelle, in terms of what you're hearing from some of the members of Mother's Esquire, again, you know, how do you overcome this, this really pervasive stigma around flex time? And, and, and how do we learn the lessons, as Fatima just outlined, from the pandemic that flex time can really be, one, a competitive advantage for talent, can ensure the retention of women, women with children in particular, and that women are getting a path forward. Yeah, I really appreciate what Fatima had to say too about, about how important this is in terms of retaining and, re and attracting uh, top talent, uh, because I think that is uh, certainly should be a strong motivator for employers. Um, I would like to go back to what I said earlier about enacting the kinds of structural change in your policies and procedures that are going to um, really support parents. So again, if you don't have, well, first of all, if you don't have maternity leave, we need to start right there. <laughs> then <laughs> let's let's go ahead and let's get that fixed. Um, but it, instead of adopting a maternity policy, let's adopt a parental leave policy that's in compliance with the EOC guidelines on um, on uh, on those kinds of um, policies. Let's not adopt um, implicit bias training that is a check the box mentality. Let's not put up uh, window dressing, as we say. Let's change the culture. Uh, let's really look at how to infuse these um, these kinds of changes. Um, uh, these kinds of things into the culture. And that is why I really like bias interrupters because it's really looking at how we change the culture, not just check a box on our website that we have done implicit bias training. Um, and then um, I think also, uh, are we going to get to this in a minute, Bobby, about some of the um, lactation uh, support? No, bring it up now. I think this is a good time to, to, to bring it up. So I think that one of the things that I found, I think part of the reason I speak about this so frequently is because it's such a clear example of a structural bias that is a real impediment to, to women, um, women who are choosing to breastfeed, is the bar exam policies across this country do not provide clear, transparent, accessible uh, accommodations to women who are breastfeeding. Every single bar cycle, I end up writing a letter to or on the phone with a bar um, a, a bar examination a board member over the fact that there is a woman who is pleading for them to provide her with 10 extra minutes to pump. 
Um, and just such a clear disconnect. Uh, and I'm sorry if I get a little um, uh, animated over this, but it's so frustrating to me because it's such a clear example of the kind of structural biasing. So that whole, um, um, don't fix the women, fix the system thing comes up for me here because it's like you're telling a woman like run forward, go, go, go. But you've put a brick wall right in front of her. So don't be surprised when she gets knocked back when she runs into it. Um, so those are the kind of structural barriers that I think we really need to dig into. So and it's not just um, bar exams, but it's bar meetings, bar uh, council, um, your annual bar meeting of your state. Law school. So uh, several of you mentioned having a baby in law school or your children during law school. I had a baby when I started law school. I was still breastfeeding when I started law school. I had another baby during law school and breastfed for another year with her. I um, I love my alma mater and, and no criticism to them, but I pumped on a um, old 1970s style plasticky couch in a basement bathroom in the law school library. I didn't even know to ask for something better. I just thought that was what it was. Well, I know now. And um, so law schools, bar exams, bar groups and employers providing, like looking at those kinds of structural barriers and removing them because um, it, it creates just such a, a disincentive um, for women to want to stay with you. It creates such a barrier for women to succeed in this profession. Um, so those are some things that pop to mind. And, and thank you for that work because you've really made a difference uh, in two instances already. Michelle was able to get the bar examiners to give time. So, you know, it's really important and thank you. Um, Stephanie, we've been reading <laughs> in uh, legal, uh, legal media and in the Wall Street Journal about uh, law firm leaders and clients who are demanding that their lawyers come back full time and that uh, really don't implement hybrid work policies. And, and I think Fatima did, did um, highlight that this is difficult in terms of how do you implement a really successful hybrid work system. But what, what would you respond to these, uh, to these leaders yeah, so and clients? I, yeah, I, I don't think that's the majority view of law firm leaders. I think uh, a couple perhaps very powerful clients said, well, that's what we're doing and we want our law firms to do it. But I've been impressed at how quickly law firm leaders kind of pushed back on that. And I'd like to pick up something that Fatima said because I really believe uh, that she is right about this and we've also talked about it. And that is, you can't react to the moment. You really need a strategy it's a good time to say, what do I want to look like in five years? Do I want to have a wide range of talent or not? If I don't care, then I'm not going to do anything different. But if I look at what's been happening to my firm or my corporate, corporate law department over the last five years, and who's been hired and who's been promoted and who's left, if I look ahead and we stay the same, are we going to be better off? Or are we better off with goals of having a broad array of talent and appealing to clients? Are we better off adjusting our practices and policies about women and women with children so that they actually do work? They're not just uh, you know, for, sh for show. And um, I know, Bobby, that you wanted to spend a little bit of time on sort of everybody's favorite best practice. I don't know if this is the time to do it or not. We're gonna we're gonna do it at the end. Okay. So uh, save save it oh, for that. You know, I, I do want to to push back a little bit because I think um, there has been a lot of mixed messaging. I think law firm leaders are saying we're going to have remote work. But again, I think the proof will be in the pudding as we gather data to see what that means or whether or not we're going to revert back to the pre-pandemic gender divide where women are the ones taking hybrid work and the men are in the office and what are the advantages. If you do not, if you're not intentional and you don't have a system that really analyzes what's going on. And that's the point of having a strategy. I mean. It, you set your goals and then you say, well, how are we going to get there? Because the old way hasn't been working. 
So let's think about what we can do differently. Let's look at assignments differently than we have. Let's look at introductions to clients differently than we had. Let's look at who is lead on a matter differently than we had. There are lots of ways to do it. I think that each employer has to pick the ways that they think will work for them, but it can't be same old, same old, because otherwise they'll end up in the same old, same old place with a much worse result in five or six or eight years because they're gonna keep losing a greater and greater percentage of the legal profession. A greater percentage are lawyers of color, a greater percentage are women. They're just not gonna be able to attract the talent they need to succeed unless they adjust, truly adjust policies and practices to be very broadly inclusive. I'm gonna open it up. I, I, I think what's really important and because Stephanie and I are um, extreme data geeks, um, and I love data because we know all of this happens, but as soon as we have data, apparently that is the gospel. So what are the metrics that we need to implement? I mean, I think let's sort of dig down and, and be specific. I'm going to start with you, Fatima, and then we'll, we'll go around the Zoom boxes. <laughs> well, it, so I do think we should pay very close attention to women lawyers share of the workforce. We saw some real drop offs around people feeling like there weren't options for them to stay connected to work over the last year. We need to pay close attention to that. We also need to find ways to measure whether law firms and other legal organizations have paid leave policies, have remote work policies, fair schedule policies, and what percentage of men and women actually access them. Sometimes there is a written policy and then people under, there's an implicit understanding that if you actually use the policy, there will be a penalty. And so you don't have a lot of take up. So we need to have that information. We need to have information around pay, right? If women are connected to work, but that penalty shows up in lower pay, not just in the short term, but over time, you know, that is not just unfair, but will eventually become a retention problem. And then finally, we need to have information around promotion and pathways. You know, <laughs> one of the things that is for sure true, Stephanie, is that the, the percentage of people of color and women who make up the legal profession, it is dramatically different. You keep looking at the numbers coming out of law school. The percentages, especially in large law firms at the top, are shockingly the same as they have been for many decades. And, and so that is a metric that matters over time. And, and I would love to see meaningful transparency around the whole so that we are actually able from a consumer in and from an employer in to make some evaluations around what are the places that are putting their money where their mouth is and dedicated to the advancement of women in the profession. Well said. Um, we do have a question and I'm going to open that up. Um, what can working mothers who aren't in leadership roles do to assist in bringing about the changes? I know I've presented research to my employer, a woman-led organization about the mutual benefits of remote work um, and the impact of these implicit biases on working mothers to no avail. I feel somewhat powerless. So I think it goes to what can individual women lawyers do and others, uh, men as well, to interrupt this bias? I don't know who wants to take it. So uh, uh, let me start if, if that's okay. Um, sure. I, I actually, I've said this before, I'm a great believer in the power of small groups. I am not a great believer in the power of one person going into a leader's office or a leadership meeting and saying, here's the problem, here's what I suggest. But I have been incredibly impressed that even in very large organizations, if you get together five or six people together, who are giving the same message to the very top of a firm or to the very top of an organization, people pay attention. And certainly if it's important and meaningful to a number of people in an organization, it should be okay to get four or five. And you can really structure 
a presentation and structure the message. And it's not you alone. It's not, oh, she's kind of off. She's just a nag. It's a group of people and they have much more impact than just doing it yourself. So that, that's my view, being a small group. I think also, and Judge Reyes, i just make one comment. Today may be the best time for uh, lawyers in terms of do they wanna make a change? I think the pandemic has made everyone reevaluate what are their values? Where do they want to work? Who do they want to work with? And uh, you know, uh, just in regular labor force, four million millennials quit in April because their employers did not offer millennial remote work. So I think yes, you have power, and you should try. If the if it's not a good fit, think about where it will be a good fit because there's more. Uh, to 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 practicing law than just being a, a drone in some place and, and try to find the employer where you can actually build on your passion. I know Stephanie and I are still practicing law and that's because we're in organizations where we continue to love the practice. Judge Reyes. Yeah, I just wanted to build on what Stephanie said. I think she provides some really key insights and, and a couple thoughts actually came to mind. Uh, uh, some positive steps employers can do. One is to uh, support and, and provide uh, a, a, an employee resource group, in other words, a women's uh, resource group, because then you'd have a group of women that would be able to meet. And the, the purpose of a group is for them to obviously to share and talk, uh, but also to provide the employer with suggestions of how they can improve the, the workplace there. And, and hire, retain, promote, and advance women within the organization. When I was in house counsel, I, I, I'm going to actually, it was Cargill, I, because I think they had really good, they had a really good and very, very strong uh, women's employee resource group. And then I ended up uh, helping form and became the first president of the Hispanic Latino employee group. But we modeled our group after the women's group. And another program that they had uh, and by the, by the way, their group was absolutely phenomenal. Another, another program that that group had, the Women's Employee Council, was something called Mentor Up. So they would have women, um, rising stars, mentor high level uh, leaders within the organization. And that was a way to have those uh, candid and confidential, but very insightful one-on-one -on -one conversations to help the leaders who were mostly white males understand the issues that they were facing. So those are just some kind of concrete examples of what, is, what can be done. But I think it's important in terms of metrics, what gets measured gets done. So you know, really look at and, and really reconsider what are the metrics that are in place, really focusing on the quality of work, looking at uh, what uh, can be done to, to um, uh, make sure that there's a measure of who is coming in and who is leaving and why, they're, why they are leaving. I, I think it's important to do that self-evaluation for the employers, uh, because if, if you don't know what the issues are, there's no way you're going to improve. And as, as uh, both Stephanie and uh, Fatima said, now's really a, a good time to do it. Because this is, this is one of those uh, rare, uh, unique opportunity moments in the profession to look at what have we done in the past what has worked, what hasn't worked, and what has changed and that we can continue to use that would be positive going forward. And Michelle, what if you had one policy that you would like to see implemented to really address this motherhood penalty, what would it be? That's just too hard of a question, Bobby. <laughs> I have to go back to paternity leave. I have to go back to equal parental leave. I think that's incredibly important I, because I do think we set our workers up, our teams up for this gendered assumption around parental roles from the beginning when we don't acknowledge the importance of fathers from the beginning of a child's birth we make this assumption that mothers are important and fathers are not and I think that um, if you aren't offended by what that does to women be offended by how that treats men um, be offended at how that treats fathers and 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 their valuable role in the lives of their children um, and and um, and not only that it doesn't take into consideration uh, two 
father families or um, other other different kinds of families that are very important and that we should value in our workplace. And if, if it's okay, if I take another minute, I had a couple of um, follow-ons to some of the really great comments that were made here. And um, I love Judge Reyes's comment about affinity groups um, and to Stephanie's point too about the importance of working together as groups. Um, I would point out too that there's some really great research on out there on how to make affinity groups really effective. Because I think if you, um, again, to Stephanie's point about being intentional, being structured, being strategic, um, using some of that research and how you build an affinity group if you don't have one. I also really recommend separating out a parent group from the women's group, because I think, again, we don't want to signal that parenting and caregiving are only women's issues. They should be shared issues among women and men. So um, I ran a women's group at a firm that I worked at, and I made sure that we then formed a separate parent group that was comprised of men and women in the firm. I think we want to continue to signal over and over again that parenting is a gender neutral um, uh, uh, activity, Olympic Olympic sport, uh, as Bobby said earlier. So, um, and then I wanted to add a couple of metrics that I think kind of play off a little bit of what Fatima was saying. Um, first of all, pay audits and pay transparency. I think we need to keep coming back to that over and over again. Um, as you said, Bobby, that meritocracy sort of approach, there's this strong belief around, um, you know, that that I got this book of business because I'm really good, not because somebody handed it to me. And therefore, because I got this huge book of business, I am also deserving of this much larger salary without really digging into some of the metrics behind that. So I think really, having a third party um, pay audit done with some consulting around what does that mean and looking at those numbers and helping firms look at that would be super helpful. And to the same, um, kind of on that same note too, is um, in terms of metrics, looking at originations of the legacy books of business. So how do, it, do, do books of business get passed down? Because we know we have, uh, Fatima, I think earlier talked about how there are so many types of biases and many of which we don't always dig into, um, but there are affinity biases where you tend to like to work with people who you think are similar to you. And so then when you've developed a book of business and you retire or you change firms um, or change employers or, or whatever that might be, and you you have a legacy book of business if you don't if there's not some structure around how that happens it's very likely that that's going to follow along affinity bias um, lines and um, and we know what that's going to look like in, in especially large law firms um, probably small law firms as well so I, those are some metrics that I um, wanted to throw in there as things that I think about oh and last thing diversity bonuses put your money where your mouth is if you value diversity equity and inclusion make it part of your compensation structure, your bonus structure. Don't say you're going to do it, actually make it meaningful. Great, great tips. And Stephanie, uh, we have two minutes left. So um, I know you had a, a thought about a policy you would like to see implemented. You're going to get the last word. All right. Well, thank you. Well, you know, uh, for most of my career, the old way of firms hiring past the entry level was We'll just find someone else. What's the difference if 80% of our associates leave? There's plenty of other people we can hire laterally and we'll use money as the enticement. Well, I think the pandemic has shown that that approach has its limits. And, uh, you know, Bobby and I both in Practicing Forward and in our recent heart article about hybrid work uh, policies have several things to do that we think firms should do, but I'd like to offer one um, that we haven't talked about yet in this program. I think that it would be a good idea for each employer to give each lawyer go over and have real concrete ways to advance. So for example, an associate should have a plan to be partner. A corporate counsel should have a plan to be senior counsel or senior counsel to be a deputy general counsel or something comparable. Um, there's room for, more, for everyone to succeed. In fact, in firms for sure, the more successful people ha they have, the better off they have and the more money they'll make. But it's striking how many people, men and women, but especially women, they don't know what it takes, they don't know. It's like a, a black box that nobody can get through. So there's there should be nothing wrong. It's in the firm's interest. It's in the lawyer's interest. Sit down, 
this is what you have to do. This is what we expect. This is how we'll help you. If you have a problem, come and see us and check in every six months to make sure the plan is working. So that's what I would consider a true concrete best practice. Well, I wanna thank our panel. We could have spoken for another hour and um, had more thoughts to give you, but I thank them for their invaluable insights, their tips, best strategies, and most importantly, their commitment to making this profession more diverse, more inclusive, and ensuring that mothers, mothers um, will succeed in this uh, legal profession. So thanks for everyone who joined us today. And as I said, the program is recorded and will be available. So thanks everyone.